name's Cor Nutflight. I'm the director of the Foley yeah. Institute. And normally, I wouldn't subject you to having to listen to me at one of our coffee and politics events. But uh, I've been doing a, a public lecture around the state for humanities in Washington as part of their Speakers Bureau program on populism and paranoia in our politics. And it fits nicely into our events uh, that we scheduled this semester on the Trump administration. So we thought some of you might be interested in hearing this lecture as well. And it goes about an hour. I'm going to try to cut some of it out, but it goes a lot longer than our normal events. Uh, so we may not have a lot of time at the end for kind of questions and answers. Uh, my topic today, cra crazy politics, actually came to me when I was giving a different lecture for Humanities of Washington on political polarization and incivility in politics. And oftentimes in discussions uh, on that lecture, people would say, well, it's not just that our politics are uncivil, it's just they're so crazy. There's all this anti-establishment rhetoric and all these conspiracy theories. Where does that come from? And so that got me to thinking about a classic book written by one of our great uh, American political historians, Richard Hostin, entitled The Paranoid Style in American Politics. He wrote this back in the 1960s. He was talking about then groups like uh, the John Birch Society and others. And uh, he argued that in using the term paranoia, he wasn't using that in a clinical sense. But rather, he was using it to get at a style of discourse that centered around heated exaggerations, suspiciousness, and conspiratorial fantasies. So he wasn't really interested in lunatics or people who were disturbed, but rather otherwise normal people who sometimes lapse into this kind of paranoid form of discourse and belief about politics. So I want to do a couple of things. First of all, I want to talk or define what I mean by crazy politics. And here I want to talk about two different styles of discourse and ways of thought. One is populism, the other is paranoia. And I'm going to talk about these, uh, explain how they're different, but also how they're related and why you oftentimes see them together in American political uh, history. Secondly, I want to talk a little bit about the nature of today's crazy politics. Who engages in it? Who believes it? Thirdly, I want to put that into a broader historical context and ask the question, are we more crazy today than in the past? And then finally, if I have time, I'll get to uh, some of the uh, reasons why I think we're seeing an upsurge <coughs> in populism and conspiratorial and paranoia in our politics today, and when uh, it can threaten democracy. So let me begin with a caveat, um, and my caveat is I'm not talking about truth today. Uh, Golda Meir, who was the uh, Prime Minister of Israel, was having a conversation with Henry Kissinger at the time about the uh, Arab-Israeli uh, peace negotiations. And Kissinger accused her of being a paranoid for not giving enough in the, the negotiations. And she turned to Kissinger and said, you know, Dr. Kissinger, even paranoids have real enemies. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to stipulate up front, there are conspiracy theories that often turn out to be true. I mean, uh, Watergate's a perfect example of that. The Russian hacking of our election, this last election is an example of that. There's also lots of economic unfairness and inequality in America today. And that's what populism speaks to, and rightly so. So I'm not uh, really going to be talking about the truth of political claims, but rather the way certain I political ideas are believed and communicated. So let me begin by talking about what I uh, call crazy politics. I'll start by defining populism. And oftentimes, when people talk about populism, they're talking about a period in American history in the 1880s and 1890s, the populist period. We had a populist party or the People's Party back then. I'll come back to that period in a minute. But right now, I just want to focus on what I mean by the idea of populism. What do we mean when we call somebody a populist political leader or a populist-style candidate? And Michael Kazin, who wrote a really terrific book on the history of American populism, said populism is a style of, of discourse or a set of ideas about democracy which embraces a Manichaean or a dualistic view of politics. It embraces a view of politics as a global struggle between an evil elite on the one hand and a virtuous American people on the other hand. Two core ideas, he said, are involved in populist thinking and populist discourse. The first is that the people, and these uh, the people are called different things by different populist leaders. You'll call the silent majority, Richard Nixon called them the silent majority. Uh, Donald Trump today talks about the forgotten man or the real Americans. They are oftentimes equated with good or virtue. Elites, on the other hand, and the elites can be an economic elite, they can be a political elite, they can be a cultural elite. They are equated with evil and malevolence. Populism is also a set of ideas about popular sovereignty. It exalts the idea of the majority will. That is seen as virtuous. Any opposition to the majority will as seen as suspect and malevolent. 
So that's what I mean by populism. It's this dualistic, Manichaean way of thinking about politics as a struggle between a, a virtuous majority or a virtuous American people and an evil elite. So what do I mean by paranoia? So uh, here I'm going to use the definition that Hofstadter used when he said, the paranoid style is a style of uh, discourse whose central image of politics is of a vast and sinister conspiracy of elites who seek to undermine and destroy the American way of life. Paranoids traffic in the birth and death of whole political orders and systems of cultural value. Like religious millennialists, they often think they are living through the last days just waiting the apocalypse. Right? So populism and paranoia are distinct ways of thinking, distinct forms of discourse, but they are related. Where they're related is they both embrace this Manichaean <coughs> way of thinking about politics as a struggle between an evil elite and a virtuous majority of some kind. Where the paranoid goes a bit further is they also embrace a conspiratorial and apocalyptic mentality. They're fixated on secretive forces that are out to undermine the very way of American life. And they oftentimes have this sense of impending doom. We're on the, the edge of teetering over and, and losing our country or losing the American way of life. So that's what I mean by crazy politics. Let me turn today to uh, the style of crazy politics today. And I think what we can all agree about is we are surrounded by populist leaders and populist causes on both the political left and on the political right. On the political right, we have leaders like Donald Trump, Sarah Palin, we have movements like the Tea Party movement, but the right-wing militia movements are all populist. On the political left, we have leaders like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, movements like the Occupy Wall Street movement, the Anonymous movement, are also populist movements. So it raises a question, and that is, who do these leaders and movements speak to? Are Americans really populists at heart as well? And a group of political scientists actually did a major study of this a couple of years ago. They asked uh, a series of questions that tapped into populist attitudes. Questions like, do you think politics is ultimately a struggle between good and evil? Or do you think politicians should nearly always follow the will of the people? Or do you think a few special interests prevent us from making progress on most major issues? Or do you think the people, rather than politicians, should make most important policy decisions? Now, all these are populist attitudes. And what they found is the vast majority of Americans agree with almost all of these. Eighty percent think that politicians should nearly always follow the will of the people. Three-fourths think that a few special interests prevent us from making uh, progress on most major issues. Uh, Two-thirds of Americans think that people, not politicians, should make most important policy decisions. So Americans are very populist in the attitudes that they hold. Now, if we're all populist, it's also true that uh, there are different styles of populism. And populism on the political left is very different than populism on the political right. And the difference is how they define who are the virtuous American people and who are the evil elites. So if you think about populism on the left, they oftentimes, uh, populists, talk about a political system controlled by corporate elites and Wall Street bankers. They talk about an economic system that's rigged against workers in favor of the wealthy, oftentimes at 1%. When they talk about immigrants and minorities, they oftentimes talk about them as part of the exploited real American workers. And they're uh, somehow being scapegoated by elites. So typical of left-wing style populism today was Bernie Sanders in the last Millions of Americans are giving up on the political process. And they're giving up on the political process because they understand the economy is rigged. They are working longer hours for low wages. They're worried about the future of their kids. And yet, almost all new income and wealth is going to the top 1%. Not what America is supposed to be about. Not the fairness that we grew up believing that America was about. And then sustaining that rigged economy is a corrupt campaign finance system undermining American democracy, where billionaires, Wall Street, corporate America, can contribute unlimited sums of money into super PACs and into candidates. So that's a good example of today's left-wing style populism. On the political right, when you hear populist talk, they oftentimes talk about a political system controlled by a corrupt, uh, corrupt politicians or a corrupt political establishment. It's basically an anti-status or anti-government form of rhetoric. They oftentimes complain about the media uh, and our culture being controlled by liberal elites. 
when they talk about immigrants and minorities, they oftentimes talk about them as stealing jobs from real Americans. Typical of sort of right-wing style populism today is Donald Trump's inauguration of this. For too long, a small group in our nation's capital has reaped the rewards of government while the people have borne the cost. Washington flourished, but the people did not share in its wealth. Politicians prospered, but the jobs left and the factories closed. The establishment protected itself, but not the citizens of our country. Their victories have not been your victories. Their triumphs have not been your triumphs. And while they celebrated in our nation's capital, there was little to celebrate for struggling families all <coughs> across our land. Okay, so that's right-wing populism. Okay. So we're surrounded by populist rhetoric, populist leaders on both the political left and the right. It's also true that we're surrounded by paranoia in our politics today, both on the political left and on the political right. On the right, you have leaders like uh, Sarah Palin, who famously warned about the death panels in the Obama <laughs> Care Act. Or my favorite one is uh, Michelle Bachman, who back in 2011 said, I wish the media would take a good look at the people in Congress and find out, are they pro-America or anti-America? Why won't the media investigate this? <laughs> it, it, it's just striking. I mean, here she is uh, insinuating that you know members of Congress are anti-America and that involved in this conspiracy is the media to cover that up. Uh, and Donald Trump, I'm going to come back to him because he's the king of, of paranoia today. <laughs> but we also have a lot of paranoia on the left. Uh, you know, Hillary Clinton was famous for talking about the vast right-wing conspiracy that was out to get her, her husband when he was president in the 1990s. Bernie Sanders oftentimes talks about billionaires conspiring to control not only uh, our <coughs> the economy, but also our political system. You have uh, Democratic senators like... Uh, Bob Graham, who believes in the truth or conspiracy that the Bush administration was involved in the 9-11 attacks and they covered it up. Without question, <laughs> the king of conspiracy <laughs> theories today and paranoia in our politics is Donald Trump. The Washington Post is keeping a list of the conspiracy theories he's publicly embraced. It's well over 60 at this point. Everything from uh, the birth or conspiracy that Obama wasn't born in the United States, the truth or conspiracy he believes that too, that the Bush administration was involved in the 9-11 attacks, that uh, Obama was involved in the murder of Justice Scalia, that Ted Cruz's father was involved in the JFK assassination, that the CDC lies about Ebola, that the government lies about the link between vaccines and autism, that climate change was a hoax perpetrated by China, he said. That the government was covering up the real unemployment rate, which he said was 42% last year. Uh, the most recent one, of course, is that there were more than 3 million illegal voters in the last election, which is why he lost the popular vote to Hillary Clinton. You can hear the paranoia in Donald Trump's political discourse by this campaign commercial that he himself produced and ran. The establishment, the media, the special interests, the lobbyists, the donors, they're all against me. I'm self-funding my campaign. I don't owe anybody anything. I only owe it to the American people to do a great job. They are really trying to stop me. Everybody knows it. Everybody sees it. We're going to win. We're going to win it for the people. We're going to win it for our country. We're going to make America great again. So you, you can hear the paranoia in that. Um, skip by that. So it also raises questions. Do, are Americans paranoid? Do, do we believe this, this stuff? Um, Joe Yusinski and Joe Parent wrote a terrific book uh, two years ago entitled American Conspiracy Theories. In fact, we just had uh, Joe Yusinski out there a couple of weeks ago talking about paranoid uh, uh, political uh, thinking and conspiracy theories. They found that more than half of all Americans believe one or more conspiracy theories. So if you simply ask, do you think that the government was in, uh, involved in 9-11 attacks? 28% of Americans think so. 31% of Americans believe Obama was not born in the United States. 36 believe that uh, global warming is, is a hoax. 28% of Americans believe that there's a secret elite conspiring to create a one world order. 22% believe there's uh, that the government's hiding the link between vaccines and autism. 44% believe the, the Bush administration intentionally misled the American public about weapons of mass destruction. 51%, a majority of Americans, still believe that 
Lee Harvey Oswald was part of a broader conspiracy despite what the Warren Commission found. Not only that, what they found is, not only do Americans, many Americans believe in conspiracy theories, uh, many of us also have what they call a paranoid predisposition. That is to say, we hold attitudes that predispose us to believe particular conspiracy theories when we hear them. So they ask a series of questions like, do you agree that much of our lives are controlled by plots hatched in secret? Or do you, do you think that even though we live in a democracy, only a few people really run things? Or do you believe that people who really run the country are not known to the voters? Or do you believe that big events like wars, recessions, elections are controlled by people working in secret against the rest of us? And we found that almost uh, half of Americans believe most of these statements. Not only that, but it runs across the uh, ideological spectrum. So liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans are equally likely to hold this kind of a paranoid predisposition that predisposes us to believe in conspiracy theories. Now, even though many of us are, uh, have a paranoid predisposition to believe in conspiracy theories, which ones we believe, much like our views about populism, <coughs> are deeply structured by our pre-existing political identities, our partisanship, and our ideological identities. Are we liberal, conservative, Republican, or Democrat? So you take the birther and truther conspiracies. <coughs> Equal numbers of Americans believe both of these, that Obama was not born in the United States, that the Bush administration was involved in the 9-11 attacks. Just so happens, the vast majority of those who believe in the Obama conspiracy are Republicans. The vast majority of those who believe in the truther conspiracy are Democrats. This is the same with many conspiracy theories. If you take global warming, whether it's a hoax or not, 35% of Americans think it is, but only 15% of Democrats think it is, whereas 58% of Republicans think it is. Or if you ask, did the uh, Bush administration intentionally mislead about weapons of mass destruction? 44% uh, of Americans overall think we, uh, they did, but 74% of Democrats do, whereas only 27% of Republicans do. So here's what we know about today's crazy politics. The vast majority of Americans hold populist attitudes, and many see politics in this manichaean or dualistic way as a struggle between an evil elite and a virtuous majority or real America out there. The vast majority of Americans also believe one or more conspiracy theory, and many of us hold conspiratorial predispositions that predispose us to believe in conspiratorial politics. Which conspiracy theories and how we think about populism who's the evil elite out to screw the real Americans, is deeply structured by our partisan and ideological identities. Okay, so if that's what we know about crazy politics today, let me try to put this into a broader historical context. And I think a lot of Americans have a, a mythology that there was a period in American politics that was uh, more sane, more civil, and less paranoid than today. That's the myth. The reality is really something quite different. Uh, Yusinski and Parent write in their book that Americans historically have been quick to anticipate tyranny, despotism, and a full spectrum of apocalyptic scenarios. And I'm going to try to hurry through some of these earlier periods of uh, populism and paranoia in American politics. But uh, clearly the American Revolution is a period of deep populism and paranoia. Uh, you know, you have the uh, this populist rhetoric like uh, um, Tom Paine saying the duty of a true patriot is to protect his country from its government, or Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. If you ever read the Declaration of Independence all the way through, you realize pretty quickly, not only is it a populist document that talks about the equality of all, but if you get past that you know, equality of all part at the beginning, it then lapses into a list of, of conspiratorial claims that Thomas Jefferson lays out about the British government. Uh, that you know the uh, the king is refuses assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. The king has called together legislative bodies of places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the public records. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. Uh, he has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burned our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. Now, there's no doubt that the colonists had some legitimate uh, complaints with uh, the British Parliament and King George. This is clearly heated exaggerations and conspiratorial fantasies, if you want to put it in those terms, much of these claims. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was a, clearly a populist leader, oftentimes used populist rhetoric in his campaigns. He was often ridiculed, actually, for his populism. You know, this is a cartoon entitled The Anti-Federalist Club, the Jeffersonian supporters. Uh, and this is sort of the 
forerunner of the basket of deplorables. I mean, you know, these are all sort of these unsavory types, you know, people peering off in disguise because they're astrologers or drunkards. There's this, uh, you know, slaves, this, you know, slightly satanic <coughs> figure sitting down here. Uh, and uh, Jefferson was also uh, linked to lots of conspiracy theories. The most prominent of his time was the so-called Illuminati conspiracy theory. The Illuminati was a group of uh, Freemasons out of Austria. They were a typical sort of um, Enlightenment era organization that believed that there should be less uh, influence of religion in, in government. But they were seen as uh, as a you know a deep conspiracy to bring down not only Christianity but all forms of republican government. And Link, uh, uh, Jefferson was often linked to that. That cartoon on the right depicts uh, Jefferson in the embrace of Satan pulling down the pillars of republican government. This one here is even more uh, clear in its allusion to the Illuminati. You have the all-seeing hand up here. And you have Thomas Jefferson, it's called the Providential Detection, being prevented by the American Eagle from burning the Constitution on the altar of Gaelic despotism, which was a, an allusion to the Illuminati conspiracy. This was such a, a widespread conspiracy theory at the time even uh, uh, George Washington believed that we have a letter in the Library of Congress where he talks about the Illuminati trying to bring down the Republican government in the United States. Jackson was clearly a populist leader. He was actually considered the first outsider president because he didn't come from the patrician families of either Virginia or Massachusetts. Uh, he ran on the people's ticket. Once he got elected, you know, he opened up the White House and you have these famous paintings of sort of the unwashed masses coming in and being drunk and dancing and cavorting on the White House uh, lawn. Once he was in office, he made good on many of his populist uh, um, uh, policies. He, not only did he give the franchise to peop uh, uh, people who didn't own property for the first time, but he also disestablished the National Bank, which he claimed was an instrument of what he called the money to interest in the United States to <coughs> oppress Americans. He was also ridiculed for his populism. He was oftentimes called Andrew Jackass or Andrew Dumbass. <laughs> uh, he was also linked to all sorts of conspiracies. Uh, most of these uh, had to do with his membership as a Freemason. Uh, he has the cartoon depicting you know, his cabinet all in their Freemasonry gowns and aprons. Uh, this actually led to the first American third party, the anti-Mason party, which was basically an anti-Jackson party, concerned about the secret conspiracy the Masons had to bring down Republican forms of government. Uh, I'll skip by the Civil War. It was also a period of populism, lots of conspiracy theories, but it was a little more complicated with the slavery issue. I want to go straight to uh, the Gilded Age and the uh, era of populism, the 1880s and 1890s in the United States. This was clearly a period of wrenching economic and demographic change in the United States with, with nationalization of the economy, industrialization of capitalism, um, with uh, waves of immigrants, and it led to tremendous polarization of income and wealth. Uh, the working conditions of average Americans in the inner cities in particular were just simply Dickensian in nature. On the other hand, you had uh, lives of opulence with these uh, dynastic, dynastic families like the Rockefellers and the Morgans, Carnegies and others. Led to a lot of populist rhetoric in our politics. This is a cartoon over here depicts the U.S. Senate as a bunch of school children being lorded over by big corporations and trusts. Uh, this one here depicts labor as burdened down with debt. That was an allusion to the gold standard, which was seen as you know, hiking up interest rates and, and making it impossible for workers and farmers to pay off their debts. He's looking, a laborer's looking at a tombstone here that says, here lies American prosperity, assassinated and stabbed in the back by President Grover Cleveland and other traitors in Congress. This, of course, led to the establishment of the People's Party, the, for the real populist party. A uh, group got together in Omaha, Nebraska in 1892. They nominated James Weaver as their first presidential candidate. They adopted the platform. If you read through this platform, you will see echoes of both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump in this. You know, it begins by saying, we meet in the midst of a nation brought to the verge of moral, political, and material ruin. The people are demoralized, voters intimidated, businesses prostrated, homes covered with mortgages, and labor impoverished. That sounds an awful lot like the carnage that surrounds us that uh, Donald Trump talked about during his inaugural address. Uh, then it goes on, the toil of millions is stolen to build up colossal fortunes for a few, and the possessors of these in turn despise the republic and endanger our liberty. From the same prolific room of government injustice, we breed two great classes, tramps and millionaires. Sounds an awful lot like Bernie Sanders. 
the most famous populist of that period was William Jennings Bryant. He was nominated to run as president in 1896 and again in 1900, both on the populist party's ticket but also the Democratic party's ticket. It was a fusion ticket. Uh, and the as Democratic establishment viewed William Jennings Bryant much the same way as the Democratic establishment viewed <coughs> Bernie Sanders in this last election as a hostile takeover of the party. They distrusted him. This is a cartoon depicting him swallowing the, uh, the Democratic Party. Uh, his opponent in those two elections was uh, uh, William McKinley. McKinley was depicted as sort of a tool, an instrument of big corporations and big Wall Street uh, money power. Uh, here he is sitting in the hand of big money. You've got a cuff link here. And it says, uh, it's got skull and said labor written across it. Uh, lots of conspiracy theories during this period. The most uh, popular one at the time was the so-called gold conspiracy theory. It was the idea that the gold standard was a conspiracy of Jewish international bankers to uh, extract money from American workers and others. This is a depiction of Jewish bankers actually putting a crown of gold on American labor. Uh, it's led to uh, William Jennings Bryant's most famous speech, the so-called Cross of Gold speech at the Democratic Convention in 1896. And I got that, but I won't play it because it takes too long. 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt was a populist candidate and a populist leader. He often used populist themes in his campaigns and had populist uh, policies. The New Deal was a populist set of programs about spreading the wealth, taxing the wealthy more progressive income tax structures in order to create a social welfare safety net. Uh, typical were cartoons like this one. This shows FDR shaking hands with, it says right here, the forgotten man, and it says, oh yes, you remembered me. This is a Depression-era piece of art that depicts Franklin Roosevelt as the patron saint of Ameri average American workers. Um, you can hear the emergence of modern left-wing populism in, in uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, political speeches. You can also hear the paranoia in his political speeches. One of his famous speeches was in 1936, where he talks about the forces arrayed against him and their hatred of him. We have to struggle with the old enemies of peace, business and financial monopoly, speculation, reckless banking, class antagonism, sectionalism, war profiteering. They had begun to consider the government of the United States as a mere appendage to their own affairs. And we know now that government by organized money is just as dangerous as government by organized mob. Never before in all our history have these forces been so united against one candidate as they stand today. They are unanimous in their hate for me and I welcome their hatred. So clearly a populist and also a little bit paranoid. Um, but as populist as Franklin Roosevelt was, he was actually attacked on both the political right and the political left by other populists. Uh, Father Charles Coughlin was a, a famous radio broadcaster uh, in the in 1930s and 1940s. He actually uh, started as a supporter of Franklin Roosevelt's, but, but eventually broke from him because uh, Roosevelt was not populist and right-wing enough for him. Coughlin started something called the National Union for Social Justice because he so distrusted establishment politicians, you, get the beginning, you start to hear the beginning of modern right-wing anti-establishment, anti-political, anti-government uh, rhetoric in his speeches. He was uh, uh, particularly exercised about Roosevelt's, uh, the support of Roosevelt by uh, Jews, uh, and he oftentimes railed against the Federal Reserve, which he thought was a conspiracy of Jewish bankers to, to oppress American workers. He gave a famous speech in 1934 where he, you know, he lays out this broad conspiracy about the Federal Reserve System. But I'm going to play the portion where he starts to talk about uh, establishment politicians as the enemy of America. For not even Americans see so-called Democrats and Republicans. And so, Mr. Roosevelt, who was very loquacious in 
to leave this off with you. Where in each congressional district here in Illinois, we will endorse a candidate <coughs> who can rise above his party and put patriotism first. He may be a Democrat, or a Republican, or what not. <coughs> but we're true with the sham battle of politicians, and now we're on our own. So that's uh, populism on the right attacking Roosevelt, but he was also attacked on the political left. Huey Long was the governor of Louisiana and then the senator from Louisiana. He's by far my favorite populist, and you can see why in just a minute when I play one of the clips of his speeches. Uh, you know, uh, All the King's Men, Robert Penn Warren's great political classic was based upon Huey Long. Um, he had a, uh, he was basically really a sort of a socialist. Uh, his platform is a sh called the Share Our Wealth Platform, which he proposed that uh, we should cap American income and assets so no family could earn over over a million dollars a year or have more than five million in assets and after that it would be taxed and redistributed. Uh, he gave a, this famous speech in 1935 and he, uh, I want you to listen to this speech because it sounds like a speech that could be given by Bernie Sanders today. It is our estimate that four percent of the American people own 85 percent of the wealth of America and that over 70 percent of the people of America see the crystallization starting to take place of left-wing <coughs> populism there. Crystallization of uh, right-wing populism, interestingly enough, begins really, or it takes place in the 1960s. There's populism on both the political left and the right in the 1960s. On the left, you have populist leaders like Robert Kennedy, Eugene McCarthy, populist uh, causes like uh, the modern civil rights movement, the modern, the modern women's rights movement. You also have populist leaders on the left, Barry Goldwater, uh, George Wallace, but by far the most important populist to emerge in the 1960s, because he later becomes our president, is Ronald Reagan. Uh, he emerges for the first time as a, a powerful force in national politics in a speech he gives in 1964 advocating the election of Barry Goldwater. Uh, it's called the Time for Choosing speech, and here you, you, you can see modern right-wing populism identifying government as the enemy of America, and also sort of this apocalyptic view that we're you know, teetering on the precipice of losing the, uh, the real America. This is the issue of this election. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. 
You and I are told increasingly we have to choose between a left or right. Well, I'd like to suggest there is no such thing as a left or right. There's only an up or down. <laughs> federal employees, federal employees number two and a half million. And federal, state, and local, one out of six of the nation's workforce employed by government. These proliferating bureaus with their thousands of regulations have cost us many of our constitutional safeguards. How many of us realize that today federal agents can invade a man's property without a warrant? They can impose a fine without a formal hearing, let alone a trial by jury. And they can seize and sell his property at auction to enforce the payment of that fine. What does it mean whether you hold the deed to the, or the title to your business or property if the government holds the power of life and death? over that business or property, and such machinery already exists. The government can find some charge to bring against any concern it chooses to prosecute. Every businessman has his own tale of harassment. Somewhere a perversion has taken place. Our natural unalienable rights are now considered to be a dispensation of government, and freedom has never been so fragile, so close to slipping from our grasp as it is at this moment. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. Okay. Uh, so you hear both the populism and the paranoia there. So let me uh, turn finally to talk about why I think we're seeing an upsurge in populism again today. And, and I can only keep it at <coughs> the time I've got left. Two broad developments I think are important. One is uh, to understand that both populism and paranoid political discourse are uh, for losers. <laughs> they appeal to losers. And what I mean by that is they appeal to people who feel like they're coming out on the losing end of economic, cultural, demographic shifts and changes in our society. There are ways to explain why people like them, the real Americans, are losing out. The other thing that's happened is changes in our mediating institutions. And what I mean by mediating institutions are those institutions that link people to political power, to po political policy makers. And the two most important of these mediating institutions are political parties and media. And they both changed dramatically in the last 30 to 40 years. So let me just briefly touch on some of these uh, developments. So uh, clearly there has been major economic ch uh, changes in, uh, taking place in the American economy over the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, we've gone from a national economy to a global economy. Trade, automation has dramatically impacted the way Americans work and the distribution of income and wealth in our society. There are real winners and losers in this process. This just simply shows you the, uh, the um, uh, household incomes of different uh, quartiles of, of uh, American populace. Uh, why don't you look at the chart here on the political right in particular. Um, if you look at that, what you'll see is that the top 20% of Americans since 1980 have had real income gains. The top 1% have had staggering income gains. The bottom 80% of Americans have actually lost in terms of real income since the 1980s. And it's that sense of losing out that people look for for explanations. There must be some elites. It might be Wall Street bankers. It might be big corporations. It might be the corrupt politicians creating these trade deals or shipping our good jobs overseas. Why they're losing out. We've also had dramatic demographic changes in immigration over the last 30 to 40 years. We have more foreign-born Americans today than any time since the turn of the last century. Um, and uh, immigrants, of course, create um, all sorts of dynamism in our economy and in our culture. At the same time, they raise deep issues about national identity, leaving some Americans to feel like they are now becoming a minority in their own country. And in fact, they are. Within the next two to three decades, there will be a minority majority country. And many Americans see this as uh, losing out in terms of their uh, identity and cultural heritage. There, of course, have also been massive social and cultural changes in the last 30 to 40 years. The changing role of women, and changing the role of gender in general in our society, uh, the changing way we think about different groups of Americans, like gay Americans, the changing way we think about the relationship between religion and our public institutions. All this has left many Americans feeling like, and I'm going to steal a title from a sociologist book out there right now, feeling like they're strangers in their own land. 
that uh, they, uh, the, the values and cultures of real Americans uh, are being lost out and elites are foisting their cultural values on them. And they look for explanations for this. Who are the elites doing this to them? Now, if there have been these major changes in our economy, in our demographics, and in, in our society and culture, there have also been shifts in these mediating institutions I talked about earlier. So political parties, it's quite interesting, they've simultaneously done two things. One is we have become very polarized in our political parties. But at the same time, our parties have become very weak as institutions. So I'll explain what I mean by that. So this is simply the polarization index in the House and the Senate. And uh, an easy way to think about this, not entirely accurate, we can talk about it later if you want, is this is basically a measure of bipartisanship. Are Republicans willing to vote with Democrats, Democrats willing to vote with Republicans? And the higher you are on this index, the less likely you are to see that take place. Now that chart goes from the 1870s all the way up to 2013. The blue line there is the Senate, the red line is the House, and you'll see that our political parties are more polarized today than any time since we've had these two particular political parties. Our parties have pulled far apart on all sorts of policy issues, and that's also mirrored, by the way, in the American public in terms of how Republicans and Democrats think about most policy issues. What this leads to is what a political scientists call affective polarization, meaning it, it affects the way we start to think about each other as Americans. So this, and there's lots of data on this. I just pulled this one out of the Pew report. Uh, done a couple years ago, they simply asked this question, do you think that the policies of the other party are so misguided that they are a threat to the nation's well-being? I want you to think about that. No, I say, you know, do you think the other party is wrong? Do you think they are a threat to the nation? 27% of all Democrats think the Republican Party is a threat to the nation's well-being. 36% of all Republicans think the Democratic Party is a threat to the nation's well-being. <clears throat> if you look at Democrats who are consistently liberal in their views, one in two think that the Republican Party is a threat to the nation's well-being. My guess is this is much higher now after the election of Trump. 66% of Republicans who have consistently conservative views think the Democratic Party is a threat to the nation's well-being. Well, you can see when we get polarized like this, we see the other side is not only wrong, but is actually threatening our security. That this Manichaean way of thinking about politics really starts to take hold. Our party represents the real Americans, the other party represents the evil elite who's out to undermine us, to undermine the American way of life. While we become more polarized as partisans, it's also true that our parties have become weak as institutions over the last 30 to 40 years. Lots of reasons for this, I won't go into all of them. Two major reasons is the shift from caucuses to primaries and choosing candidates, but also the shift in how we run our campaigns. It used to be that if you wanted to be, uh, be a, a candidate, you had to have a deep uh, support within the party, because it was the partisans who went out and canvassed for you and rang doorbells and went on street corners. Today, that's not how you get elected. Today, you get elected by going to a special interest group, getting money, producing a, a television ad, and beaming that into people's homes. You can bypass the party entirely. Well, the, the effect of these types of changes is parties cannot control who are their candidates any longer. They are now opened up to outsider challenges, to populist-style candidacies like Bernie Sanders, like Donald Trump, both of whom were seen as, as really hostile takeovers of the party by the party establishment, the party elite. Parties, by the way, tend towards the middle. They tend towards much more uh, consensual style candidates because that's who they, they where the voters are. Outsider candidates tend uh, towards the more extreme, oftentimes populist and paranoid uh, ways of thinking about politics. So our parties have changed. Also, our media has changed dramatically. It wasn't long ago that I still remember, <laughs> many of you in the room still remember, there were basically three networks and maybe a handful of papers in any major metropolitan area. The news you received was heavily filtered through the editorial process. Editors made sure that uh, information that wasn't factual, that wasn't true, wasn't published and printed. They also uh, tried to assure some balance in their coverage. That's not the case today. There's literally thousands of, quote, news outlets on the web, uh, on uh, cable television. All of this is virtually unedited, unfiltered. 
They can publish anything they want. They don't care about balance. And once it gets printed or published, of course, it gets spread on social media like a wildfire. Millions and millions of Americans are exposed to it overnight. Uh, in fact, we know in the last election in 2016, 26% 26 of Americans said they got most of their news about the election on social media outlets like Facebook and Twitter. I'll just point out, I won't go into this. Fake news is not new. Uh, fake news has been around before. This is from the first populist era. Newspaper editorials talking about fake news and the threat it poses to our democracy. This is actually a news clip from uh, a Connecticut newspaper where they actually proposed legislation to punish, to uh, prosecute people who, who uh, spread false or fake news, calls it fake news. Uh, so it's been around before, but the, the degree of it, the way it spreads today is very, very different than in the past. So let me finish up by asking this question. Is this style of politics a threat to American democracy? And Walter Burns, who was one of my favorite uh, political theorists in the 1960s, once said, the question is not whether we will be governed by elites, but rather which elites will govern us. Now I want you to think about that. Donald Trump became an elite as soon as he was elected. The key, Burns said, challenge for Republicans to make sure we are governed by worthy elites. <laughs> so, one thing I think should be clear from my discussion about the history of populism and paranoia in American politics is that these are not necessarily undemocratic. Many of our great presidents have actually had populist themes and populist uh, platforms. So many of them also had some paranoia involved in their ways of thinking about politics as well. But there is a tension. There's a tension at the heart of populism with democratic pluralism. And that's because populism posits that there's a moral clarity in majoritarian opinion. And it characterizes dissent or opposition to majoritarian opinion as at least suspect and maybe malicious. Democratic pluralism, on the other hand, thinks of differences in political opinion not only as inevitable, but as desirable. What you want in a democracy is a clash of ideas, a clash of views. And so democratic pluralist societies try to protect minority rights, minority viewpoints, and enshrine them in things like individual rights protections. So that's the tension. The problem in terms of democracy <coughs> is when populist ideas and populist ways of thinking, especially this Manichaean way of uh, this dualistic way of seeing uh, everything as a virtuous majority against an evil elite, when those ideas get linked up with other anti-pluralist ideas, and here I'm talking about ideas like nativism, racism, religious bigotry, authoritarianism. And the reason is, is because populism gives these other anti-pluralist ideas a sheen of democratic legitimacy by equating them with the will of the majority. And I can quickly go through some previous periods where this happened. So Jackson was clearly a populist. He was also deeply racist. He didn't think that Native Americans were part of the real Americans. And he engaged in a process of relocation of Native Americans from their tribal lands, resulting in the deaths of thousands of Native Americans along the way. The Know Nothing movement in the 1850s, a deeply populist movement, also deeply nativist and also religiously bigoted. The, uh, this is actually the, the Know Nothing flag. It says Native Americans, period. Beware of foreign influence. You know, they uh, were very, very fearful of immigrants, but especially immigrants from Catholic countries. This is a cartoon depicting uh, German immigrants in a beer barrel, Irish immigrants in a whiskey barrel, <laughs> stealing the ballot box. <laughs> Tom Watson was probably the most famous and important populist in the populist era. He was the vice presidential candidate for William Jennings Bryant, and then became the presidential candidate for the People's Party in 1904 deeply, deeply racist. He did not think that uh, Americans included racial minorities. In fact, he said in the 1904 campaign, white men made our American government, they founded our country and religious system, and white men should maintain America for Americans. Similarly, George Wallace, a populist in the 1960s, had similar racist exclusionary views about who counted as real Americans. I mean, famously, when he was inaugurated as the, uh, as the governor of Alabama, he said, you know, I'm going to draw the line in dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny, by which he meant the federal government. It was tyranny, or the tyranny. 
and say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And you can see the result of when populism and paranoia get mixed up uh, with uh, uh, other nativist ideas in the McCarthy era. Uh, you, um, Senator McCar Joseph McCarthy saw deep conspiracies everywhere in our government. Communists were infiltrated everything at one point. He said, you know, I have a list of 200 names of State Department officials who are communists. Of course, he didn't, but he said, claimed that. Leads to very exclusionary and, uh, and draconian measures like the, uh, the uh, uh, Subversive Control Act that was passed uh, in the 1950s. It leads to things <coughs> like the John Birch Society that saw traitors everywhere in our government. They accused Eisenhower of being a secret communist traitor. They accused... Uh, John F. Kennedy is being a secret communist, conspiring against the American people. In fact, this was a pan bill they passed out on the streets of Dallas in the morning uh, that uh, John Kennedy was assassinated, accusing him of treason and being a secret communist conspirator. So let me conclude. So I've argued that populism and paranoia both embrace a Manichaean or a dualistic view about politics at their heart. Neither of these forms of discourse or thinking are new to our politics. They've both been around a long time. They've both been important forces in our politics in the past. Many Americans today hold both populist and paranoid attitudes, uh, and these are shaped by our pre-existing political identities in very powerful ways. Which conspiracies we believe in, how we think about the evil elite, is deeply structured by our partisan and ideological identities. I've also argued that we're seeing an upsurge or an uptick in populism and paranoia today because of changes in our economy, changes in our uh, demographics, changes in our culture, and also changes in the mediating institutions, those institutions that leak, link people to political power and political decision makers. And then finally, I've argued that populism and paranoia are not necessarily undemocratic, but they become undemocratic or can become undemocratic uh, when they get linked with other anti-pluralist ideas like nativism, racism, religious bigotry, authoritarianism, and that's when they're most dangerous. Okay, so I did make it to the end. <laughs> I had to speak really fast. So, so I, I'm happy to take a couple of questions. If, uh, if I won't be offended if people have to take off, but if there's any questions, I'm happy to skip. What about other countries? Yeah. Do, you, do you feel like other countries are also prone to populism? Yeah, no question. In fact... <laughs> <laughs> Next lecture. <laughs> In fact, here's just a couple of populist leaders overseas right now. Marine Le Pen is yeah. probably the most important one. She's right now leading in, you know, they have a presidential can uh, election coming up. She's now the leading contender there. Uh, likely will be a front runner when, when they have a runoff election. Um, but you also see uh, populist leaders uh, like uh, <coughs> Nigel Farage, the UK party in Britain. He, he hangs around. In fact, he was at the speech last night, <laughs> Donald Trump did. He came and campaigned. He was on the campaign trail for Donald Trump. You know, he's the one who led the Brexit, Brexit vote in, in Great Britain. Uh, Norbert Hoffer is a, a you know, right wing populist of the Freedom Party in Austria. There's also left wing populists. Uh, so Alex Tisparas uh, was a Syriza party uh, uh, prime minister, was a left wing populism, uh, and they refused you know, to cooperate with the EU and Germany in particular <laughs> with the restructuring the debt problem. But it was a very populist cam uh, uh, campaign they ran and populist platform they had. So populism, yeah, is, is spreading throughout the West right now. Yeah. Does it tend to moderate, or do we just? Does the pendulum just swing from one end of the populist uh, uh, spectrum to the other every eight to ten years? <laughs> well, I don't think there's any. Uh, I don't think there's any pattern to when populism emerges and and recedes. But I, again, if you go back to why I think we're seeing populism emerge again today, it has to do with deep divisions in our society about really important problems. You know, our economy has fundamentally restructured itself. And that has led to millions and millions of Americans working harder and harder for less and less. And the question is, what do we do with it? How do we respond to that? And Americans are deeply divided over that question. And until we resolve that question, populist rhetoric, it says the people to blame are the evil bankers or it's the evil politicians who cut these trade deals. That's going to be very appealing to people who are out of work. 
or people who are working at service industry jobs that barely pay a you know, wage that they can live on. Um, you know, that's, that's, you know, those are real issues. The issue of I political identity and immigration. I mean, again, it, it, it's immigrants bring all sorts of vitality to our country, but they do raise these questions about um, how do we think of ourselves as Americans. And until we have a conversation about that and work through that problem and build a consensus, uh, you know, populist uh, appeals and nationalist <coughs> appeals are going to be attractive to many Americans. So, so I, what I would have us focus on is, is less the candidates and the causes and more on the underlying issues that are giving rise to this style of thinking and, and believing in about politics. Does that make sense? So that said, um, how close are we to the actual disintegration of the right or the left and the true emergence of a real third party? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't make predictions. Uh, I, I predicted Donald Trump would never be president. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see how accurate that was. Um, you know, I thought, actually prior to the election, I thought, well, you know, the Republican Party has become so divided, internally divided, that it either ha has to fundamentally reform itself or it will cease to exist as a party and a third party will emerge to take its place. Uh, you know, parties exist for one reason, that is to get people elected. If they cannot get people elected, then they cease to exist. And they either fundamentally reform themselves or a new party emerges to take their place. You know, the Democrats look like they're the ones in trouble right now. <laughs> now. Now, I think that's a more appearance in reality. I still think the Republican Party has the deepest divisions within the party. These are going to become more and more exposed as they have to govern now rather than be in the opposition. It's easy to be united in the opposition. Very difficult to be united when you're actually governing and making policies. And I think you're going to see that deep division. And there's a deep, deep division between the populist wing of the Republican Party, represented by Trump and, and Bannon right now, versus the establishment wing, represented by people like Mitch McConnell and uh, Speaker Ryan. They have very different views about things like trade, infrastructure spending, tax reform, uh, immigration. Uh, and as they try to address these issues, those divisions are going to get more and more exacerbated. Now, does that lead to a collapse of the Republican Party? I doubt it. But, um, I, I do think that the Republican Party has to move one direction or the other, and that might make it less or more competitive in American politics in the future. I, I didn't answer your question, but... <laughs> yeah. uh, comment on the question. I, I would maybe draw maybe a little brighter line than you do between paranoid and populism. Because populism, I, civil rights was a populist movement. Yeah, no the feminist movement. The, some of the most important things that have gotten done in American society were populist ideas, right? Yeah. So, so I, 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 maybe I wouldn't connect populism and paranoia quite as closely as you do. But let me ask you the question now. <laughs> How many of these populist leaders believed what they said? Did Huey Long really believe that stuff, for example? Or was it all an act? Who knows? That's like asking me, you know, does Donald Trump really believe what he says? Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, do I think, yeah, do they, I mean, I think, if you look at someone like Franklin Roosevelt, he clearly believed yeah. what he was saying. His populist ideas. I think he really long believed a lot of what he was saying. I mean, what did he believe at all? I don't know. <laughs> but, but let me just go back to your first point. You know, I, I don't see paranoia and populism as the same, but they are deeply connected. And that's why you see them together oftentimes in American political history. history. And it's this embrace and, and of this mannequin way of thinking about politics. And once you start seeing everything in, as a struggle between an evil elite, however you want to define that, and a virtuous American people, um, I mean, that's what leads you down the road of populism, but also paranoia. And also, you start to see you know, conspiracies amongst them. The only, the only difference is whether or not you think they're doing it in secret or not. You know, Bernie Sanders, I don't call him necessarily paranoid, because he thinks that corporations are screwing the American people open. He doesn't think they're conspiring necessarily yeah. you know, uh, to do it. Um, you know, sometimes he does talk about them conspiring. And so, and, yeah, but. But, you know, uh, but that's the only difference. Whether you think they're doing it secretly or openly. Yeah. Well, there's another thing um, that you need to introduce here that and I'm surprised we haven't talked about it, is demagoguery. 
And that's when you cross the line into authoritarianism and non-democracy. And so I was wondering why you haven't brought demagoguery into that. Well, I, again, I, you know, demagoguery is, um, to me, it's, it's more important what kind of demagogue you are. So if you're a populist demagogue, which I would call someone like Trump or Hillary really Long, yeah. they were populist demagogues. So what, make, what makes them interesting, from my perspective, is they're populists. Right. But that's another kind of, yeah. you know, yeah. it's not left wing, right wing. It's about how do you see the democratic system, and when you want to work outside. And I would say Trump is more of a demagogue, a populist demagogue, because he does not understand what democracy is. And he doesn't really un he undermines the democracy. I don't think that he want, I, I think that I don't think that's necessarily true. I think I think uh, Donald Trump is a majoritarian, and he thinks he represents the majority. And he thinks that the majority's will, embodied in him in his election, ought to govern. Now, now you can call that undemocratic, which you know I think it's certainly anti-pluralistic. Um, and you can say he's not doesn't really represent the majority, which is probably true. <laughs> But in his mind, I think he represents the majority. He's the embodiment of the majority will. And he thinks opposition to that is no other. And he sees it as a problem. Now, I think, you know, this gets my views about him as a person. I mean, I think he's a greater danger in terms of his authoritarianism and how you respond to opposition to the majority will, what he perceives to be the majority will. And that's where he gets into his rhetoric about him, the media being the enemy of the American people. Notice what he says. The media is not my enemy. Yeah. It's the enemy of the American people, which he believes he wants because of his election. That's yeah. Okay, well, we pro I probably let you go. I've gone on too far. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it.